So welcome to this week's Mentoring Hour. Um, my name is Smita Narona. I think most of you here should um, have already been introduced to me either in class or in a previous Mentoring Hour. Uh, so today we are going to be uh, looking at the topic, Keep the Fire Burning. Uh, I think last week there were some questions on suffering that we didn't address. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, can we just open with a word of prayer? Would someone be willing to uh, pray for us before we begin? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this uh, hour of mentoring. Father, we pray that uh, as you minister to us through your word, Lord, we will be able to retain what we have learned, Father, and apply the same in our lives, Father. Yes, sir. We also pray, Father, for a blessing upon all our, all our teachers and all the students of our Bible College. And pray, Father, that we will continue to live and walk in a manner that will be honorable in thy eyes, Father. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Um, so we did have a few questions that were not addressed from last week uh, on suffering. Uh, maybe we can address those questions before uh, we go into today's topic. Uh, so the first one was, how do we teach non-believers about suffering? Um, I'm not sure who asked this question. We just have the questions here. But how do we teach non-believers about suffering? Uh, is there anyone from our faculty who would like to respond to that question? Um, yeah, hi, uh, Smita. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, uh, with regards to teaching non-believers about suffering, well, it's actually a wonderful opportunity to share the gospel. One thing is, uh, we don't have to uh, prove to anyone that there is suffering in the world. They already know that there are various kinds of suffering. So um, one can actually take that opportunity to share you know, the biblical perspective of why there is suffering, the source of suffering, that uh, we have a good God. And um, you know, this is the source of all suffering. And... Uh, and yeah, take it from there. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity to build bridges and share the gospel. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jakes. Um, I'll just add, and then if there's any other faculty member who'd like to uh, share, you can share. Um, so I think, uh, like Pastor said, it is a really great opportunity to share the gospel. Uh, uh, especially because there are such few answers um, and such few answers that really satisfy the heart uh, when it comes to um, questions about suffering uh, apart from the cross, right? Because in the cross, uh, we see that Christ has taken on our suffering, that he is uh, borne so much of the pain uh, that we don't have to bear. And now, um, while there is suffering that we still experience, uh, we have the comfort of knowing um, that Christ is with us in that suffering, that we have the Holy Spirit with us uh, in that suffering. Um, and to know that uh, there is hope beyond our suffering also. Uh, there's very little outside of the cross that answers that question. Uh, when we look at different faiths, uh, um, we see that there is either um, this thing of overcoming all desire so that you don't suffer or uh, there's the other answer of this is uh, a consequence of your own mistakes of your own past sins um, uh, or uh, the other thing is suffering 
is just there. We can't escape it. Uh, so the, those are the kinds of answers that people are getting. Uh, and obviously, it doesn't minister to people who are hurting those answers. Uh, and so to offer them Christ, to offer uh, the hope that we have in Christ is something uh, that can really uh, be some, uh, something that ministers to them. So yeah, that's just one thought. Would anyone else like to share? Any other faculty member? And if uh, if that question was asked by someone who's here on the call, uh, let us know if your question um, got answered satisfactorily or if you have any further questions. Uh, I I just like to share something, Smitha. Yes. I think uh, the best example would be our own testimonies. Uh, we've all gone through uh, suffering. So, you know, uh, what did we do at that time? How we uh, trusted in Jesus? And, you know, um, of course, the suffering may not have gone away immediately, but the strength, the courage, uh, the peace, the joy, the assurance that we have, the confidence that we have, um, that enabled us to go through that suffering, uh, you know, is something that uh, other religions don't uh, uh, off. I mean, have an answer to or offer. So I think that can be a good thing, like how you went through the suffering and how uh, God really enabled you, strengthened you, helped you, and how you came out uh, refined in that process. Uh, how it's it built your uh, perseverance, your endurance, your perspective to life, and uh, your relationship with God. And I think uh, all that can really help uh, a person. And also uh, that, you know, um, uh, the grace and the strength that God gives us, and ultimately how he uh, saw us through, or carried us through, or walked us through that entire uh, process can also be a great encouragement and help and can help others to put their trust in Jesus. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Selina. Okay, we'll go on to the next question. Um, if, if you had a question, uh, that was not answered last week. Uh, we have three questions here, so we'll go through these three. But if there was some other question, feel free to post uh, on the chat. Uh, so the other question was in the story of Saul. Uh, and then uh, there's a quotation from scripture. Now the spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh tormented him. So the servants of Saul said to him, look, please, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. Uh, the question is, how can we see this? Because God won't take delight in seeing his people suffer or being tormented. Um, would someone uh, be willing to answer that question? Let me know if I need to repeat the question as well. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Smita. Thank you for reading out that question. I'll just try to uh, answer it. So in the in the passage that we just read, it seems like uh, the evil spirit was sent by God. Uh, so you know it, it it seems that way, but we would need to interpret scripture through scripture. And uh, when we look at the rest of scripture, uh, we see that you know uh, God is not a God uh, who sends evil to uh, torment and uh, cause people to suffer and that's pretty clear uh, and therefore uh, you know when we interpret this passage then uh, we we would know that though it is it seems like that that's not what it means um, and uh, just want to make reference to uh, a scripture in uh, the book of john john 14 and verse 30 where um, the latter part of that uh, verse says, for the prince of this world come, comes and he has nothing in me. So uh, Jesus is very clearly stating that, you know, uh, he is separate from Satan and that nothing of uh, Satan is a part of him. And therefore, you know, when it comes to demons uh, being sent out to torment people, uh, obviously it's not God who is, who is uh, doing that. Uh, and so uh, God doesn't 
you know, uh, cause people to to suffer. Uh, and um, we've already addressed this question uh, in the last uh, last uh, mentoring hour when Pastor Jake's uh, Jai Kumar had. Uh, taught about suffering, that there are many reasons why there is suffering, but definitely it's not God who causes it. So just want to uh, share that. But if uh, any other faculty want to add to this, uh, please feel free to. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, would anyone else like to add? Any other? Anyone else from the faculty? Praise the Lord. I'm from uh, Kolkata. I just joined uh, just now. Actually, God allows suffering so that we can realize our mistakes and we can come back to Him and correct ourselves because. He doesn't, uh, he allows uh, sufferings only because uh, for us to correct ourselves and to come him, come to him and uh, uh, and obey, obey him and uh, worship him. Uh, just, I just wanted to share this. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think uh, Pastor Jakes uh, did cover some of the reasons for suffering in um, last week's session. So if you missed that, you can go back and watch the video uh, that's available on our YouTube page or on Google Classroom or the e-learning platform. Um, and yeah, Pastor Jakes, would you like to add anything uh, in answer to this question? Yeah, I just want to uh, quickly um, add that, um, uh, especially about Saul, King Saul, and the spirit that uh, tormented him. We, we see very clearly that the spirit of God departed. And of course, we're talking about the old dispensation, where the spirit of God would come uh, for a purpose and would leave. And so the uh, spirit of God had departed. So the divine protection, the hedge of protection, um, you know, was which was around Saul was not there. And therefore, whenever somebody steps out of that, um, they make themselves vulnerable for the attack of the uh, evil uh, evil one, for the evil spirit. So that's the thing. So like we addressed earlier, God is not the source of suffering. God is not the author. But um, and like uh, this uh, sister uh, Sharmitha um, mentioned, so God is not the author of it. I just wanted to clarify. But in the event of that happening, you know, in the event of rebellion, in the event of uh, us stepping away intentionally from God's divine protection. Uh, well, God still uses that for sure, but it's not God's perfect, you know, God's not will that one should suffer, you know, because we see in the original um, uh, design that um, it is not, uh, God did not design with suffering. But if I designed the world with suffering in it, and we see the end also in Revelation that, you know, he's wiping away every tear and there's no sorrow, there's no pain. So um, we should be very uh, clear that, uh, you know, that our God is a good God. He did not, allow, he does not, um, you know, uh, he's not the author of suffering, but in the event of this, you know, in the event of us stepping out of divine protection, well, God still uses that for our good, right? Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have one last question. Uh, it's uh, how to handle when suffering comes and we have to go through maybe year after year and people from other beliefs ask, where is your God? What should our stand be on that? I've posted the question here on chat as well. Uh, would one of our faculty like to address that, please? Um, yeah, um, so it can be a uh, you know it can be a challenging season, right? Um, and uh, to to go through, and also um, for us to make sense of it first of all, and then if there are questions from others um, who do not you know know Christ, um, to actually you know 
answer that answer them also so one thing is um, well uh, we cannot answer and satisfy you know everybody's questions but we can just share you know this is the hope that we have that uh, whatever we are and whatever we are going through on this side of eternity right is um, you know we can share whatever we have learned we can share that uh, uh, that aspect the source uh, of suffering and the, you know why it happens and so on so it, you know if year after year in a, in a it's a difficult season it's a challenging season um, and that's why you know we are called to run the race with endurance you know um, and uh, and through faith and patience inherit the promises right so definitely i'm not um, like you said earlier also you know it, it can be challenging uh, we're not um, downplaying it but uh, but this is the hope that we have right so um, so that's the only answer right uh, we others might still have questions you know what about your god why is he not doing this that and so on but we can use that opp opportunity to share the hope that we have you know the reason for the hope that we have in Christ, and and keep going, right? And uh, and I think the first question what we shared, you know, about death, uh, uh, you know, about the hope that we have in Christ. You know, nothing can actually satisfactorily, no worldview can satisfactorily answer that. Uh, and there's this tangible hope and comfort uh, that we have um, in Christ is something that we can we can share. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Um, would anyone else like to add to that? Anyone uh, on staff? Uh, I think Pastor Jacobar has answered it quite adequately. OK, sure. So I think uh, that was all the questions that we had last week. Uh, uh, if you had a question that was not answered, uh, feel free to add that to the chat. Um, but we can go into today's topic. So um, I had given us the topic, keep the fire burning. And uh, I'd intended uh, to talk about how we can stay strong um, in ministry so that uh, we continue to serve God till the end. We don't uh, lose uh, lose focus. We don't lose our steam uh, and uh, burn out uh, before uh, we get to the end of fulfilling all that God has for us. Uh, but as I was preparing, um, God kind of redirected uh, what I was going to share about, uh, but it still falls under this uh, theme of keeping the fire burning uh, from the perspective of keeping our passion for God uh, and our love for God uh, in a place of uh, going strong. So where we don't lose our love for God in the process of serving him. Uh, or in the process of following him. Um, why, why is this important? Because uh, this is the biggest key to us serving God faithfully, uh, to serving God uh, fully till the end. Uh, but also, uh, it is the only kind of work that would be pleasing and acceptable to God is where we are serving from this place of love for God, uh, where we uh, continue to have a passion that is so fervent for God uh, that that fuels all that we are doing, uh, all the work that we are doing for his kingdom. Um, so we'll read a few uh, passages of scripture, and I may just ask one of us to read. Uh, we begin with Mark 12, 28 to 34. If someone could read that for us, please. Mark 12, 28 to 34. Okay, um, shall I read? Mark, sure. 12, Mark 12, 28. Um, so then one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he had answered them well, um, asked him, um, 
asked him, which is the first commandment of all? Jesus answered him, the first of all commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So the scribe said to him, well said, teacher, you have spoken the truth, for there is one God and there is no, no other but he. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the soul and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Uh, but after that, no one dared question him. Thank you, Pastor. So uh, we see here and we see this in uh, all the Mark, Matthew and Luke that uh, this commandment is repeated as the greatest commandment or the most important commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, uh, right? Uh, why uh, is that given to us as the most important commandment? Uh, because from our heart is where all the issues of life uh, come out. Everything that we do, all of the uh, good things, all of the bad things flow from uh, from within us, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so uh, this is the place where we need to be making sure that uh, all of our energies are focused uh, in uh, love, in uh, submission and surrender and worship to God. Uh, and we see here also um, that it's more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices uh, that we can offer. So as people who uh, are, many of us are serving in different ways. We are either uh, serving in churches or in full-time ministry. Uh, often those ministries, the work that we are doing for God can uh, can take over our lives, right? Because there are such great demands on our time, uh, on our energy, on um, on everything that we have to give that uh, the time that we are spending actually with God in his presence uh, is, uh, is what gets sacrificed for the sake of the ministry. Um, uh, but in Revelation 2, 2 to 6, we see that Jesus calls the Ephesian church back to his back to its first love or to the love that it had at first for. Uh, it doesn't say for God or for people, but it just says, come back to the love you had at first. Um, if somebody could read that for us, Revelation 2, 2 to 6. Um, Shosmita, uh, can I read? Yes, go ahead. Okay, sure. So Revelation chapter 2, uh, from verse 2, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this is you. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicol Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Thank you. Uh, so we see here that uh, Jesus is commending the church in Ephesus, saying, I know your deeds, your hard work, your perseverance. Uh, you cannot tolerate wicked people. You have tested those who claim to be apostles and have found them to be false. And then uh, right at the end, verse 6, you hate the practices of the Nicolaitans. So they're being commended for their hard work through challenging times, through persecution, through hardship. Uh, they have continued to serve God. Uh, they have held on to truth, not letting false teaching come into the church. And uh, the Nicolaitans were uh, 
a cult that uh, had kind of allowed idolatry and um, worship of uh, the imperial, so uh, the Roman uh, leaders, Roman emperor, all of those things, they were kind of allowing that within, uh, with also worshiping Jesus. Uh, so uh, these were the kinds of things that the church had not accepted. They had made sure that they stayed and they continued to serve God even, uh, even in the face of opposition that was coming their way. Uh, but still, this is not uh, satisfactory in Jesus' eyes. right? So he says, yet I hold this against you. Uh, you have left your first love. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Um, and so... Um, it's important for us to realize that uh, the work we are doing is not the end that God is looking for. Uh, it is definitely good, and uh, the love that we have for God should uh, result in us serving Him and serving uh, His people. Uh, but if we are letting go of love, but continuing to serve God, uh, that is not satisfactory in God's eyes. Uh, so let's just take a quick look at, uh, at the Ephesian church. Uh, they came from the city of Ephesus. So Ephesus was known for uh, worship of the god Artemis, uh, who is a fertility goddess. So they had uh, one of the most renowned temples uh, that had been uh, built in Ephesus, and uh, it had thousands of priests and priestesses, and many of them uh, served as sacred prostitutes in the temple. Uh, so this was the background that they were coming from, the religious background many of them were coming from. Uh, apart from that, there was also the imperial cult, so the Roman emperors who uh, demanded worship. So there was that uh, political pressure that came in with the religious side of things. Um, and then uh, we see uh, from the history that we have in scripture about how the church ha had been established by Paul. So Paul visited Ephesus during his second missionary journey. And uh, he spent a very short time there, although uh, the people there responded positively to the gospel. He, uh, he had other uh, places that he had to visit, and so he didn't spend a lot of time there. But he did go back in his third missionary journey, and he spent over two years in Ephesus uh, teaching and from Ephesus also teaching in the rest of Asia. Uh, but between those two visits that he uh, had, those two journeys, Apollos had gone uh, to Ephesus and had talked to them about the baptism of John, uh, which uh, people had received positively. So when Paul went back, uh, they had not heard about the baptism in the name of Jesus. And uh, so Paul taught them about it. He prayed for them and they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and immediately began to manifest uh, gifts of the Spirit. Uh, we also see that there was open confession of sins. Uh, we see that they um, they actually rejected some of their cultural practices openly. So uh, we have an account in Acts 19 where they brought uh, their scrolls with, uh, they usually used to wear uh, scrolls with magical incantations. So these were tied around their neck to keep them safe from all evil. Uh, they brought all of these scrolls and burned it in public. Uh, and the value of the scrolls uh, we have recorded as 50,000 days wages for an average worker. Uh, so it was not, uh, small sacrifice that they had made. Um, and Paul himself testifies in 1 Corinthians 16, 19. He says that a great door for effective work has opened up in Ephesus. And so he uh, continued to stay there and minister because of the, uh, the way the church was responding and the opportunity that he had from Ephesus to minister in the rest of Asia. Uh, so we see this is how the gospel impacted the church at first. 
All right. They also had opposition from Jews and Gentiles alike. They were not allowed to continue to meet in the synagogue. Uh, so they had to leave and meet elsewhere uh, where Paul was teaching them. Uh, then we also see that the Gentiles started to come against them because they were abandoning worship of uh, their the cultural goddess who was Artemis. Uh, so they had all of this political pressure. They had uh, pressure from uh, the culture around them, from uh, the religion that was prevalent in their culture, uh, and from uh, the Jew Jews as well, because the Jews didn't want to associate with them because they were causing trouble for the Jews, uh, being people who uh, were viewed as a sect of the Jews. Uh, the Christians were initially viewed in that way. So uh, with all of this, the church continued strong, right? But somewhere along the way, uh, they had forgotten that initial love that they had for God that had made them forsake all other things and follow him. Uh, instead, they had gotten caught up with uh, the work that they were doing for God. So uh, the the things that they uh, were, the ways in which they were serving him, holding on to uh, doctrine, all of those things became important to them. And those things became the end goal that they were working for. Uh, those things became the things that they were passionate about, that were consuming their thoughts uh, to the point that they had neglected God himself. Right, so they were uh, not falling into the idolatrous practices of the culture, but in their hearts they had allowed these things to become idols uh, instead of having God be uh, the only one who they were worshiping, the only one that they were giving their whole heart to. Uh, so, as um, as students here, as faculty here, uh, as uh, alumni from the Bible College, we're all people who definitely love God, people who are serving God, uh, and people who uh, love the truth, right? That's why we're in Bible College, because we want to pursue uh, a deeper knowledge of who God is. We want to know uh, what, discern what is right from wrong. Uh, but how can we uh, keep ourselves from falling into the same trap the Ephesian church fell into? Uh, we'll just look at uh, the example of uh, Mary. Right? We have the story of Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. And uh, we see a contrast between Mary and Martha, uh, whereas Martha is said to have opened her home to Jesus. Uh, she's also, uh, it also records for us that Martha was distracted by all the preparations and she was worried and upset about many things. Uh, and this is what Jesus says about her. You are worried and upset about many things. Uh, but Mary, on the other hand, she sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Um, and Martha testifies, she's left me to do the work by myself. But Jesus testifies, there's only one thing that's needed, and Mary has chosen what is better. Uh, so this is the one thing that Jesus commends. And Jesus says, this is the better thing to choose. Uh, it is to be in communion with me, to be in my presence, to delight in me, to listen to me, to learn from me. Uh, that's what he desires. Uh, Psalm 27.4 uh, David uh, writes the psalm and he says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord, that is, that I may be in his presence all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. Uh, so uh, David also talks about the same things of uh, being in the presence of God, of communing with him, of delighting in him, uh, of seeking him, of uh, desiring to know him more, hungering for more of God. Uh, that is where we should make sure we don't compromise, right? No matter how, uh, how much we're growing in ministry, no matter 
uh, how um, how much are other responsibilities maybe growing outside of ministry with family or uh, with our work, whatever it may be, uh, to never compromise on that dwelling in the presence of the Lord, uh, of delighting in Him, of seeking Him, uh, because this is where that fire that we have in our hearts for for God will be rekindled. Uh, this is where that fire will keep staying strong. Uh, if we look at examples of our relationships with um, uh, in marriage or our relationships with our parents, relationships with our children, uh, oftentimes we get so busy just taking care of the people around us, right? We have to serve them, we have to take care of our homes, take care of the needs of the people around us, that we lose uh, we lose sight of the fact that uh, these people are people we're supposed to be in relationship with, uh, people we should just enjoy spending time with, getting to know uh, them, delighting in who they are, uh, delighting in this gift of uh, relationship that God has given us. In the same way, uh, we forget that with God as well, uh, where we get so busy just doing what we're supposed to do, following uh, all the rules, checking off all the things that uh, that seem good to us or seem good to the people around us, uh, that we just forget to delight in this gift of relationship, which is such a beautiful, beautiful thing, right? To have a relationship with our Creator, uh, our God who rescued us, saved us, who restored us, um, to be called into relationship with Him. Who, uh, what, uh, what else can offer that to us? That kind of relationship, that kind of friendship, of uh, a place of uh, safety, a place of acceptance, a place of knowing who we are, who we truly are created to be. Um, so my uh, reminder to us today is to come back to that place of just delighting in God, to make sure that we don't let other things take us away from God himself. Uh, however good those things may seem, uh, and especially because those are the outside things that uh, everyone else gauges our spirituality based on what they see on the outside. Uh, so everyone thinks that we are doing really well uh, based on how our ministries are, how we are serving, uh, and uh, what is the fruit of the work that we are doing. Uh, but only we can stop in the presence of God and examine our hearts to see uh, whether truly what we're doing is coming from a place of love. Um, and so I want to encourage us to, to do that, to stop and examine our hearts in God's presence, to allow God to show us whether He really has that first place in our lives. And if, if we find that... Um, we have fallen away from God as our first love. Uh, this same passage in Revelation 2 tells us how we can come back. So the first is to remember from where you've fallen. Uh, remember means not only to recall, but to return to. Uh, that is uh, to go back to that first place you were in. Um, and uh, when Revelation, when uh, Revelation talks about fallen, uh, there are three ways in which it talks about it. It actually uses this word a lot. There are 23 times in Revelation that the word fall is used. Uh, and in the New Testament as a whole, it's 91 times that it's used. Uh, but 23 of those times are in, in the book of Revelation. Uh, so it talks about falling down in worship before God. That's one way fall is used. The other way is falling from a place of glory to a place of destruction. And the third way is judgment falling uh, on people. So uh, what is interesting here is that uh, the church, the Ephesian church, 
uh, used to be the church that was falling down in worship in utter reverence for God. But it's fallen from that place of glory. And God is warning them of judgment falling on them if they stay in that place uh, of uh, falling from a place of glory into a place of destruction. Uh, and so he's calling them back to this place of just falling before God in complete awe of who God is, being lost in worship, being caught up in uh, his love for them. Uh, that is the kind of worship we see described in Revelation. Uh, and how do we do that? It's by remembering. Uh, remembering what God has done for us. We see constantly in the Old Testament, God calling the people of Israel back to uh, remember what he has done for them, how he has been faithful to them, how he has saved them, how he has walked with them, uh, the miracles that he has done in their midst. And he says, uh, in different ways, they are called to remember. So to uh, set up altars, uh, to pass it on to their children and their children's children. Uh, those are the ways we can make sure that we don't forget what God has done by sharing our testimonies, by having uh, physical reminders of uh, how God has uh, worked in our lives. So one thing for me is um, I have a little um, art. It's like a, a little, it's not a painting, but it's it's something that a friend of mine made for me. Uh, she'd once asked me what was the most important attribute of God to me personally. And um, one that had really, really drawn me to God was friendship. And so she made a little uh, this thing for me that I have up in my bedroom. But every time I look at that, I'm reminded of how God has worked in my life, of how he has been a faithful friend when I felt like I had nobody else. So having those kinds of reminders around us, uh, verses that remind us of what God has done in our lives, or words or pictures uh, that remind us of ways in which God has worked in our lives. Uh, the other way is to repent. So uh, repentance here is changing our heart, changing our minds, turning away from sin and turning to God. And then the last is to do the first works. So uh, interestingly here as well, we see that God is calling them, them back to work. He's not saying stop working, right? He's saying work, but do the work like you did it before, uh, from a place of love, from a place that is motivated by love. Uh, like we see in 1 Corinthians 13, the true value and meaningfulness of what we are doing for God is found when it is coming from a place of love. Um, the other ways we show true love for God, uh, as scripture talks about, is by obeying God, John 14, uh, talks about obedience to God being evidence of our love for him. Uh, and 1 John 4, 20 and 21 talks about loving our brothers and sisters, that if we claim to love God, we must love our brothers and sisters. Uh, so these are the works, the first works of love that must be evidenced in our lives. Uh, and they should all come from a place of truly loving God. Um, so we've come very, very close to the end. So I'm just going to stop here. We just have a few minutes. Uh, if you all have any questions, any thoughts you would like to share, please go ahead. And um, yeah, anything that you would like to share or questions with regard to this topic or any other topic. Uh, thanks, Mitha, for sharing. Uh, I was just thinking, as you mentioned, uh, uh, you know, like uh, some reminders around you, they, they really help you to keep that uh, focus alive. So even, uh, you know, like prayer or committing ourselves to, to spending time in worship. Uh, so many of these, these things that God has already called us to, I think when, when we have that as part of our daily routine, 
uh, it's so very helpful to to continue to keep us uh, in in that place of love uh, so that we can receive from god and you know from that outflow uh, comes our ministry and everything else that we do for the lord so uh, i was just thinking that it's so sorry uh, that it's so important to guard it and uh, to to make time for uh, these things yeah just just a thought there thank you thank you thank you pastor nancy so um one question that i okay i think uh, brother kofi are you do you have a question yeah sister uh, please, you, can you throw a little can you please throw a little light on how their first love was like how the church's first love was like okay so uh where we covered a little bit of uh, the history of the church, uh, we see that uh, they uh, completely turned away from other things, right? We see how uh, all of the challenges that they were facing, all of that didn't stop them from publicly uh, confessing their sins, from publicly uh, giving, uh, sacrificing financially. So those were evidences of what they uh, felt. We don't have uh, any other account of uh, what exactly uh, what else the church did we we see the manifestation of the spiritual gifts so these are all the external things that we can see like we talked about there are external things that we can see and we can judge by those external things but god knew their hearts uh, so uh, that's where um, it comes to our personal uh, standing before God, examining our hearts before God and looking at, are we truly delighting in God? So uh, if if anyone else was looking at the Ephesian church, they probably thought that they were still very, they were still doing very well spiritually because they were still holding on to the truth. They were still persevering in spite of the challenges and the opposition, the persecution that they were facing. Uh, but God says, they've they've let go of that love that they had at first uh, and so uh, that is something that god only can reveal to us uh, and for this church god was able to expose that for them that they had uh, forgotten that uh, initial devotion uh, and delight that they had in god i hope that answers your question thank you thanks Any other questions? So uh, I'll ask a question uh, for our faculty. Um, how do y'all make sure um, when things obviously get very very busy there's a lot of pressure there's a lot to be done um like past nancy mentioned having this as part of your daily routine uh how do you uh make sure that you don't let go of it uh when you feel the pressure of so many other things uh on you and uh the second part is even in those times, how do you make sure that you're really worshipping rather than just worrying about all the things you have to do? Did any of our faculty want to answer? Yeah, for me personally, uh, I think it's pressing in more uh, and also kind of uh, pulling away uh, like pulling away I mean that um, you know uh, just to get into a um, you know, a personal time with God pull away from the activity activities around um, but also um, not to cool down but to press in more you know and that always uh, is there not to uh, and I'm just reminded of um, you know this scripture Mark chapter 4 
where it talks about um, you know the measure that we go uh, the measure that we use is what will be measured to us of course it talks about revelation and um, uh, you know understanding that we get um, it's mark chapter 4 and um, verse 24 uh, take heed with what you hear you know so uh, i just find that um, that very refreshing in the sense okay i go with a big, big measure with a big level of hunger and god always pours in you know pours out uh, into my life so um, and i am refreshed and renewed again yeah thank you I'm sorry. I sorry. Think yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, we've come to the end of our time. Um, if anybody had any questions, uh, you can feel free to post in Google Classroom. In, uh, yeah, I think uh, Pastor Nancy, they can do that, right? In the main audio. Yes, they can. Okay. So you can feel free to post there, um, and we'll have your questions answered. Thank you all for joining us today. See you next week.